Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Lots of things going on in the church, and uh, very exciting. Um, first of all, baptismal classes are going on now. Uh, for the next several weeks, there will be baptismal classes, and it will be held during Sabbath school hours for the youth and a half hour after service for the adults. Please see Raquel for more details on this one. And, of course, the prayer circle um, each uh, Sabbath after worship is still going on. And there would also be a, a short parents' meeting today to discuss the upcoming adventure camping trip in August. See Jolita at the end of the service um, if, you, um, if your kids are members of this. There's also a board meeting. Um, it has been changed this month to Wednesday, so it will be on July 12th at 7 p.m. Uh, and next Sabbath, July 15th, immediately following worship, there would be a men and young men's Bible study group. And the topic is, how can we as men make good decisions? Bring your Bibles and support this thinking. And for the kids, Vacation Bible School time, it's coming up. Save the dates for Sunday, July 16th to Thursday, July 20th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It will be uh, an exciting time for our kids. Um, they will learn and enjoy and, and more about Jesus. It will be a very um, good week for them. So if you are interested, please see Theresa Sordo for details. And if you would like to help, it's very welcome to also, uh, on Sunday, July 23rd, there would be a diabetes educational workshop going on here. Uh, you will learn how to manage or even prevent diabetes in your life. Um, for, and speaking of after church service, there will be a 30-minute meeting um, in the fellowship hall for those who are uh, interested in helping out and those who have committed to, to join in this. Um, Tammy will talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and lastly, um, it's with, with great sadness um, to let you know that our sister, dear sister Albina passed away last Sunday. I'm sure you all remember her. She was a dedicated member of our church. She's always here serving the Lord. Um, we will really, really miss her. So just please pray for her family during this um, sad time. That's it, and happy Sabbath. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Let's sing a couple songs this morning before our service starts. Um, our first song is It Is Well, 530 in your hymn books. Oh, oh, oh. 
Let us pray. We're here, Lord, to worship you. And we thank you for that privilege, for your invitation. So please draw us closer to you, in whom is fullness of joy, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Right. Morning, everybody. And let me add my welcoming you to the second half of 2017. Hmm. So last week, Pastor Pottinger was here. That's why we had to switch. He, he is my pastor. And, you know, when his, 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 his diary has priority. And we were able to switch. So that's why I'm here today. That doesn't normally happen. Normally I'm here the first Sabbath of the month. But this is the first time I'm here in the second half of 2017, so welcome. That's a very dry welcome. And that's not how we do things here. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not, I didn't mean shouting, but that's good too. I meant, you know, we're family. And family, I've learned over the decades that I've been married to someone from the not-so-German side of the world. Family is tactile. So that's why we get up Sabbath mornings to greet each other, not just shout, hello, from a distance. No, we need to get up close and personal. So at this time, I invite you all to, to stand where physically possible. And whether you know the person next to you, behind you, or across the aisle or not, give them a lovely smile and welcome them to this place. Amen. Thank you. Let us stand and greet each other at this time.
Um, our call to worship this morning is, uh, is in the back of your hymnal. It's uh, 704. 704. If you don't have a hymnal with you, there should be one in the back of the pew in front of you. 704. I'll read the dark and the light print, um, and you'll read the light print only. If I lift up my eyes to the hills, if I lift up my eyes, eyes to the hills, where shall I find help? Help comes only from the Lord, maker of the heavens and earth. How could he let your foot stumble? How could he, your guardian, sleep? The guardian of Israel never slumbers, never sleeps. The Lord is your guardian and your defense at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you against all evil. He will guard you body and soul. The Lord will guard your going and your coming, now and forevermore. Amen. We can go straight in, into our opening hymn. It's number 75, hymn number 75, The Wonder of It All. Please stand. Please be seated. Uh, we invite uh, our brother, Elder Joe, to come here for Minister Matters. Good morning. Probably not too many of you know that there is an anniversary coming up. And sometimes we say anniversaries are pleasant, right? Particularly as husbands, we better, right? In October, about the middle of the month, five years ago, this is coming October, we had a surprise, and it wasn't very pleasant. It was Superstorm Sandy. It wasn't supposed to happen. Now, what does it have to do with Ministry Matters? Well, for some of us in Adventist Community Services, disaster response North American Division, it means a lot to us because we were running the state warehouse free. 
Catholic Charities were busy responding to people, free. The Lutheran Organization, the Salvation Army, free. Because what? We serve the master in disaster response. We're part of community services. Now, I'm going to be handing out at, at the doorway as you leave a simple little trifold pamphlet, I guess, folder. And it, it's put out by FEMA, our National Agency for Emergencies. And it's simply entitled, Prepare for Emergencies Now. Yes, we're in a hurricane season. There's a tropical depression out there in the Atlantic. And who knows where it's going. But emergencies and disasters happen everywhere. Everywhere. There's things we need to think about. You need to think about in preparing. It could be one house where a tree comes down, takes wires on it, and burns the house from a local storm. That's an emergency. Certainly the death of an 18-year-old shot in the head by an irate motorist is an emergency for that family. But we're also talking disasters, and disasters can be one house or 10,000. But there are simple tips to think about putting it all together and what you need to think about for disasters. A couple weeks ago, we had tornadoes around us. Does that make you feel comfortable? Tornadoes or straight line wind shears that could take an airplane and crash it to the uh, ground. We don't know. We know from scripture that it ain't going to get any better. So we need to give some thought to being prepared. And so this is a simple guide put out by the government, which we use in our disaster response training, which incidentally, we were in the middle of when Superstorm Sandy decided to come inland. Right, Calvin, Willie, others? We had this feeling inside on, on Saturday, we train on Saturdays and Sundays, that something's not right. When I say we, we the volunteers and us trainers and pe people that helped us. So we canceled Sunday. Well, we got slammed. Storms do that. And so be prepared, folks. All right, I'm going to hand these things out and pay attention to it, please. We need to give some thought to the, the days ahead. And I believe the pastor has something to bring to you. And then Paul. Oh, Tammy. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I first just wanted to um, take just a moment and thank the Lord for um, the life of uh, Albina. And I just uh, wanted to um, publicly say how, um, how she was such a blessing to me um, and a help to me uh, as a deaconess. And um, preparing for the communion service, she was um, without fail always there every time I needed her. So, and a blessing all the time. So. I just want to thank God for her life, and let's remember her family. Um, and um, I want to say hi to Diane, our, our friend from Terrell, Texas. Yeah? Diane, visitor, yep. But she's, she's very vocal, so we'll, we'll, we'll let her say hi. <laughs> we're not going to make her stand up. But um, yeah, so we're glad to have Diane here. And I wanted to just quickly tell you about what's coming up. So there's a diabetes educational workshop. Shop. Um, it will be... Uh, about two or three Sundays from now on the 23rd, July 23rd. And it's a full day workshop from 10 to five. So we're gonna have a lot of things going on. Um, and uh, um, um, Jinky's helping, Althea's helping. We're gonna have stations for people and be teaching all day. We're gonna feed them a healthy lunch. Um, I've put flyers in, you know, it's, it's for the community as well as the churches. So, um, so the reason I'm up here today is because um, there's a few of us that are going to be the planning committee, and we have just a few things to plan, especially for how we're going to serve uh, up to 50 people. So um, if you, there's a few of you who, who have to stay. You're required to stay, okay? So you know who's required. <laughs> so if anyone else would like to help that day, um, I brought a little soup and some bread and I made some dessert. So whoever's gonna stay while I'm talking real quick, 15, 20 minutes tops, you can have a little, a little homemade soup. So I made that. So right after church, uh, whoever's gonna help, I know there's four or five that's supposed to be there, so don't try to get away. 
and come in the back, and I'm going to feed you. That's what I do. I'm going to feed you and talk to you. We'll just plan it real quick, just to make sure the day goes smoothly. Um, okay, so we're ready for service. All right. Morning. When I lived in London, we had a saying there, and they still have it. Because when you wait for a bus, you know, you wait and wait, and no bus turns up. And then, because they, have, they, they, they got delayed, they all stacked up, and then they all come at once. So you wait for the number 12, and wait for half an hour, and then three number 12s turn up. So Ministry Matters feels a bit like that. You know, we haven't had Ministry Matters sometimes, none at all. And today we have them all at once. Anyway, last week, last week, um, Pastor Pottinger was here, and he talked about a little booklet about stewardship. Now, I had left some material here, little booklets, which were given out for those who wanted it. But you know what? That booklet wasn't about stewardship. But that's not, that's not the big deal, because that was a good booklet too. However, today, see, this is the booklet about stewardship. And today, we have it. So if you would like one, then I ask you to put your hand up and keep it up until a deacon has put one in your hands. Right? We have them there. And we're going to do this now because later on, I don't know, if you want one, keep your hand up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. This is the booklet that Pastor Pottinger talked about containing 13 lessons, brief lessons, you know, sort of question answer lessons and so forth about stewardship. And I encourage you to, to take one and to study one lesson a week if you want. Uh, or if you want to binge study, then do it all in one day. That's up to you. But just keep your hand up until you get one. And while this is happening, remember, keep your hand up. While this is happening, while you get your gift. I watched a sermon from last week and I had to laugh because gift really does mean poison in German. But this is an English-speaking church, so you get a gift, and it's, it's quite the opposite. It is there. And so while, while we hand these out, I also would like to add my thoughts about Sister Albina. Now, we have a few uh, guests and visitors here today. Sister Albina originally came from Argentina. She lives, lived in the U.S. for quite a while, but she was diagnosed with cancer. It had metastasized, and uh, it eventually cost her her life. But I'm grateful that before she died, with the help of our congregation here, she was able to travel back home to her country in Argentina. That's where she died last Sunday. So I want to thank you, church, the board, and everybody else who, who contributed to her, her travel to be able to travel home. But it reminds us, and why we miss her, and we do miss her, and you heard Tammy um, say something, and we all have something you know, I will remember her continuous prayer requests and her, her, her multiple you know, requests to come and, 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 and anoint her and so forth, which is a sign of trust in God. And we will miss her. And she was able to travel home, meaning the country of her birth. But she hasn't traveled home yet. She is resting, right, with my grandma and some of my other friends, and some of your relatives, and my father-in-law, they're all resting. We're not home yet. We're not home yet. And guess what? When Jesus comes and we go to heaven with him, that's not home either. <gasps> Shock and horror. No, this earth is our home. We, are going to, we go in some place for a while. That too is some kind of vacation, you know, sort of an extended one, Joe. But eventually we come back here. This earth is home. Now, I don't know, Ishmael, if on the new earth there will be Argentina and the United States. I have no idea how God will rearrange the surface of this planet when he recreates this thing. But I know that I'm going to live here, right here. I may be traveling somewhere else, you know, but this is home. And so while we wait for that to happen, let us hold firm to our faith and to our Savior. As Sister Albina held firm. She held firm, and so can we, until we meet her and our Savior, 
when he comes. Amen. Done that, done that. Good. Now the buses have all departed and it's time for the children's thank offering and their story. So we need some parental supervision. Okay. So do you know what today is? Do you have any idea? Anybody know what's waiting for you guys in the back? Children's offering. Church. Church. I didn't know that. I just got told, so I'm going to tell a really quick story. Yeah. So, um, uh oh. <laughs> All right. So I have a few questions for you, and I, I so we're going to. I need you guys to be investigators for a second, okay? I have a pet at home, and I want to give you a few clues, and then you guys tell me what you think my pet is. Okay. All right. Now don't guess until I ask you. I'm going to know right away. And no, I don't have a dog. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So don't yell it out. Let me give you some clues first. All right. So my pet, pet likes to play. Don't say it. Just think. And, and you're going to formulate, formulate in your head some clues. My pet, I hope I don't say the word. <laughs> my pet likes to race around the room chasing something. Don't say anything. My pet likes to take a nap in the bright sunshine by the window. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't say it yet. My pet eats and drinks from bowls on the kitchen floor. Don't say anything yet. My pet does not like to fetch a stick. Hold on. And my pet likes to sleep on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> Look at my nose, like, what? <laughs> Come over here, Linda. No. Um, all right, okay, so who, who, who knows? What kind of pet do I have? A cat. A cat. Okay, I don't have a cat. This person a does. <laughs> what? It's a cat. Okay, now, now, let me, oh, there you go. They're a little better. That's cute. Now, let me ask you one more question. Let me ask you one more question. How, how did you know what kind of pet I had? Because it's, you said that it sleeps on the, it likes to sleep a lot. Right. 
So, so there were certain things that my pet did and certain things that my pet didn't do. That's how you knew what kind of a pet it was, right? Okay, well, guess what? So, so Christians are like that too, right? Don't we have certain things that we do and don't do so that people can recognize who we are, right? So just like the cat did certain things, but then see that cat on the refrigerator? It's like my fridge, actually. <laughs> um, so just like the cat did certain things, but then some things that it didn't do, you knew it was a cat. It wasn't a dog, because a dog likes to chase sticks, but the cat didn't. So what are some of the characteristics of a Christian? So if I was walking down the street, if I was in the store, or if I'm at work, how do people know I'm a Christian? How do they know that? How would they know by looking at me and what I do if I'm a Christian? How would they know? Do I have a sign around my neck? Am I wearing a hat that says I'm a Christian? How would they know I'm a Christian? Uh, can you call mommy? Huh? God. Do I have a sign on my hat that says God? And how do they know? How, how does someone know you're a Christian? Yeah. I can do it by doing certain things. Sing church songs. Okay. Think, of it. Think about if you're at school. How would someone know you're a Christian at school? Unless you were wearing a hat on your head that said I'm a Christian. How would they know? Because you tell them the name, your name. Okay. Come on, dig deep. What if you, if someone was hurt, what would you do? Um, you would help them. You would help them. If your teacher needed you, needed an assistant, would you help? Yeah. Would you say no? I'm not helping you. Right? If um, if someone was crying, what would you do? Um, help them. Give them a hug. Um, um, make them feel better. Something make them feel better. Yeah. So there are certain things that we do every day just that come natural to us so people know we're Christians. If I'm in the grocery store and I see someone who can't reach something, I'm going to reach up and I'm going to get it for them. I'm not going to walk by and say, I'm not getting that for them. I'm going to reach up and get that for them. If I see someone at work who needs help with something, or if someone's crying, I'm going to go over and say, can I pray for you, or anything like that. So, so there are, so if we are followers of Jesus, we have to be like Jesus and do the things that he did. How do we find out the things that Jesus did? How do we find out about Jesus? Hearing Bible stories that were, that were written from the olden days. The Bible teaches us all about Jesus, and we watch what he did, and we can do the same things. And that's why you're going to Children's Church today, okay? Because we want you guys to learn more about Jesus so that you can, so when people look at you, they'll say, oh, well, she's a Christian. She, he must be a Christian, too, because of the things that we do, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So, hmm? oh, you're going to use it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so real quick, I need just one person to pray, and we're going to be dismissed out. All right, come here. All right. Ready? Okay. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us to church here today, and thank you for making us have, have children's church, and thank you. For having us learn lessons and teach and, and and helping us to care for people. Amen. Amen.
So today's offering, not for the cats, it is for the North American Division of Women's Ministries. Um, it was established in 1898 at the urging of Ellen G. White. In the book Evangelism, we find her marching orders to the women of the church. She says, the Lord has a work for women as well as for men. They may take their places in his work at this crisis, and he will work through them. If they are imbued with a sense of their duty and labor under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they will have just the self-possession required for this time. The Savior will reflect upon these self-sacrificing women the light of his countenance and give them a power that exceeds that of men. They can do in families a work that men cannot do and a work that reaches the inner life. They can come close to the hearts of those whom men cannot reach. Their labor is needed. All across the North American division, from the United States to Canada and from Bermuda to Guam, the women of the church are engaged in serving others. They give Bible studies, hold evangelistic series, and ministers to those in shelters for battered and homeless women. They provide the needs for the needs of families seeking refuge on our shores from the oppressive regimes, teach English as a second language class, tutor children, and make bags of love for children who are displaced from their homes of their parents or their parents. The women of the church are making a significant difference in their communities and their congregations. I invite you to make a generous gift today to affirm their work and ministry. The deacons and deaconesses will now collect the offering.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for every blessing that you give us, Lord. The material things, the, the gifts to do work that we didn't think we would be able to do. Lord, we thank you for everything. Lord, I pray for everyone here that has given and pray for those that who could not give that you will you will bless them, Lord, and continue to to teach them your way. Open up our hearts to the Holy Spirit and be here today as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. a special time when you can open our hearts all together in the same toy. Open our hearts to, to Christ, to Jesus, to our Lord, and uh, pray together. I have a special uh, list that I would like to ask to remember. Some of our brothers and sisters that cannot come and worship with us in person here. I want a special prayer for our sister Claudia Ramirez that can no, lo no longer come here and worship together with us. Uh, Inez Miri and uh, Charles Pasquale. I also want to ask us, our brothers and sisters to remember our sister Agnes' uh, mo mother that she's traveling back to Kenya tomorrow, that we can remember her in our prayers. Uh, we also want to remember um, Sister Albina's family that uh, to her moment, to their moments of um, um, sorrow. So we can uh, all together lift our hearts to God and ask him to be with us. Let's pray. Precious Father, we want to magnify your name, O oh Lord, for all the great things you have given us, for your great love, mercy, and the truth that you have show us the way. We praise your name because we have the opportunity to be together as a family with the same thought of praising your name, Lord. 
we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to be within our hearts, to mold us, transform us, to make us the way you want us to be. Lord, we ask you to forgive our sins. We have disobeyed you. We have sometimes uh, wandering away from you. And we ask, Lord, to so please bring us back to you. Draw us close to you, Lord, so we can feel your presence in our lives. Please, Lord, we have special needs that we want to bring upon you too, Lord. We have uh, some of our brothers and sisters that are going through difficult times, to times of uh, sorrow, for times of uh, sickness. And we ask, Lord, for your mercy to send your Holy Spirit to uh, cure us, to bring us close to you, to heal our diseases, and uh, let us be close to you, trust you, put our lives completely in your hands. We ask you, Lord, to get us ready, prepare us to that glorious day when uh, you come to take us home, Lord. We, we wait for that precious day when uh, there will be no more sorrows, no more pain, and there will be the great happiness of be closing to you next to you, walking with you every day. Lord, please help us to experience that today, to start walking with you and uh, have you as the master of our lives. We ask, Lord, to uh, be with us as we worship you this morning. Be with Pastor Stephen as he brings break the bread of life to us. That cannot be his words, but your words through him that can um, feed us and help us be ready to be with you. Lord, we praise, we praise your name for all the blessings you have given us. And you ask us to continue helping your church, guiding your church, guiding each one of us that we can walk with you and be ready to meet with you, Lord. We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So um, we have special music. We have special music. Uh, Today, from a very special person. Um, if we can so find if her. Natalia, if she is nearby. She's MIA. <laughs> Maybe she's just getting prepared. Let's give her a moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she was very gracious to sing this song because this is a song that I actually sing to her every night before she goes to sleep. So thank God she's uh, willing to sing it for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
No. Thank you, Natalia and Althea. That was a great song. Praise the Lord. I invite you to open the Bibles in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 11, verse 3. The book of Acts, chapter 10. Uh, we're going to read uh, from ver uh, chapter 10, verses 44 through 11, 3. It is uh, the word of our Lord. <clears throat> While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that those this should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. I uh, invite the pastor to come up to bring the word of God. Uh, 
Somebody free me, please. There are pastors who like to stay right here throughout the entire sermon. That's fine, but I'm not one of them. I need to roam. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. So last week, Pastor Pottinger was here, and he spoke about How God sustains his children. Anybody remember that? (laughs) And he gave a couple of examples how God sustained his children. You know, the Israelites in the desert with their what's it food, because manna is Hebrew and it means what's that. So when we say manna, All we say is the Hebrew word for what's that. So Bill, if we were having this conversation in English as Israelites, we would have said, what's that? And you would have said, well, that's what's that, right? Meaning manna. And I would say, yeah, I know, but what's that? And God sustained his children there for 40 years with the what's that food. And uh, the widow whose two children were in danger of going into slavery, widow of a prophet at that, how the vessel with the flour, the pot of flour did not run low in the oil, I mean sorry that was the widow, we're coming to that in a second, now how she poured out the oil into the vessels that she had borrowed and when all the vessels were full then the oil stopped and then there were these two other examples and I want to sort of hook into those. The first one was in Genesis In Genesis 21, we read the story of Hagar and Ishmael. Now, just to give a background for those who weren't here last week and who may not know the story that well, Abraham, his wife was Sarah, and God had promised Abraham that he would have so many descendants that they couldn't be counted. He used the sand by the sea and he used the stars overhead as, as illustrations of how many descendants Abraham would have. The problem was that Abraham was old and so was Sarah and so offspring didn't quite naturally come to that couple. And that bugged Abraham because he remembered the promise of these, this vast descendants group. So how are you going to get all these descendants and there's no child in your own family? You know, you have to start somewhere. And so Abraham suggested and Hagar agreed, I mean Sarah agreed, that if Sarah doesn't work, then maybe Sarah's slave, Hagar, could step in for her mistress. So said, so done. And that was more successful because a baby boy was born and his name was Ishmael. And then Sarah has a child as well eventually, we know that, but not all was well in that family. Because, you know, when you tinker with God's plan, then there may be problems ahead. So eventually Hagar and Ishmael had to leave. They were exiled. They were banned from the camp. They were outcasts. And last week the story was to show how God sustained this mother and her son in the wilderness where there was no wawa. And there was no shop ride where what they had to eat was what they took with them when they left. And when that had finished, they couldn't replenish what they had taken because there was no Wawa and there were no shop rides. Or if you're a bit more posh, you know, Whole Foods. Hey, 
could have gotten organic water there. Anyway, Genesis 21, we read that they had been sent away and in the desert, we heard in the sermon last week that when their supplies had run out and the water had finished, that they had in their portable container, Hagar left Ishmael lying under a bush and she walked away about a bow shot's distance because she said, I can't watch my boy die. And there they were. And then in Genesis 21, in verse 17, God heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what's the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Verse 20. God was with the boy as he grew up. God was with the boy. You see, this was not just God sustaining his children. This was God sustaining the outcast. Let me come down here a little more, because I need us to, for us to, that needs to sink in. Abraham, the patriarch, had sent Hagar and, his, and her son away into the wilderness. He had exiled them. They were now outcasts. They were no longer part of the household of Abrahamic faith, as it were. They were kicked out. And yet the Bible tells us that God was with the boy. And not just when he lie there, when he lay there under the bush ready to die of thirst. No, this is after God had provided for them uh, life supporting water. This is as he grew up. So not only did God provide for Hagar and Ishmael, the outcasts, by keeping them alive, now the Bible tells us that God was with the boy. If you have a problem with that, that God takes care of the outcasts, then don't come to me afterwards and tell me. No, go to the one who wrote that. I'm just a messenger. If you have an issue with God taking care of the boy whom the Arabs believe to be their forefather, well then don't take that up with me. Because God said he was with the boy. You know that, right? That the Jews see Isaac as their forefathers and the Arabs Ishmael. And so ever since we have this problem. But none of them can claim that God is on their side exclusively because God was with both of them. So let me throw this right in here. When you watch the news tomorrow and you hear some anti-Muslim stuff on there, I don't want you to say, Amen, I'm so glad I'm a Christian. If you want to say that, that's fine. I mean, I can't tell you what to say and what not to say. But when you say that, let me be very clear here, you may have a problem, not with me, not with me. I've taken the freedom of speech thing very much to heart. You can say whatever you want. But you have a problem with my boss. And I'm not talking about Pastor Cortez. My other boss. The one when he comes, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. When they see him. But you know that there are many Muslims right now who worship God in ignorance, right? And that while you see them go up to meet the Lord in the air, you may stay on earth and burn because of your ignorance. That might very well happen. So next time you see something anti this or anti that, don't be too quick to agree with that. Because it might just be the glue that keeps you on this earth when it is destroyed. God was with the boy. I'm just rubbing this in here. Let me just take a break for just a second because we're talking about the other children. Last week, it was God sustains his children. We were all saying amen because we thought he was talking about us. But today I want to talk about the other children. You see, God works in ways that sometimes we're like, 
No, 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 that can't be. In Mark chapter 4, there's a story about Jesus sending the disciples across the lake. They said, after a long day's work, we need to get out of here. We just need to, you know, it's like when you live in Cherry Hill or in Camden or in the greater Philadelphia area, sometimes you just need to get out of here. So just, just take, let's take Route 70 and don't go west where they have all the construction. Joe, right now, let's go east. Let's drive on 70 until it's just a two-lane road. And then we're going over the circle of 206, and then we're really in the sticks. Now that's where we're going to go. So after a long day, Jesus had all these people and had all done all this ministry. He said, we need to get out of here. Let's take Route 70 East. And so they got in their boat, and there was, of course, no Route 70, just to explain for those, you know. Uh, they get on the boat, in the boat, and they go on the lake, and they cross the lake. Route 70, they crossed the lake. And in Mar at the end of Mark 4, we read that a great storm came while they were in the middle of the lake and they were in danger of dying because water was filling the boat and they were afraid for their lives. Remember, these are fishermen. This was the element. When a fisherman is afraid in a boat, then, dude, I'm, I'm really worried now. See, when we fly, when you fly and there's turbulence, and sometimes there is, and you know, you grip your armrest a little tighter. But you see the flight attendants doing their job, you know, with their little push cart, and then they go back and they store it all away, and then they sit down, and you see them sitting there because they're facing you, and they don't look worried. I'm not worried. When a flight attendant starts looking worried, I get worried. When the fishermen in the boat say, we're going to drown, they were in trouble. And yet Jesus did what comes naturally in this situation when you're in a small fishing boat on a lake in the middle of a, of a huge storm and water is flooding your boat and you're about to die. He does what every one of us would do. He stands up, he talks to the wind and the waves, shut up! And there was a great quiet. Yeah, exactly. When I first read that, I was like, he did what? Yeah, he stood up and he said to the wind and the waves, be quiet, be muzzled, literally. And it's the reaction of the disciples that I would just like to throw in here. There was a great wind followed by a great calm, which triggered great fear in the disciples. And they t say to each other, what kind of of man is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him. In other words, Linda, who is that? What just happened? Who is this? There is times, like, you know, when I study something, or when we sit and we listen to a sermon or, or something, that God reveals himself to us in ways where we're like, huh? Who is this? You see, especially, let me just talk to the Adventist brethren right now. And I grew up in this church, so I have a right to comment on this church. In fact, I work for the church, so I definitely have a right to comment on this. I'm sure I still have a job tomorrow. Anyway. We Adventists crave certainty. And it's been bred into our culture over the generations since the early 20th century that we know it. We know this. We can identify the dirt under the fingernail on the third leg of the second beast in Revelation. Because we know that. We know all that. We have the certainty that we have it all. But I would just like to throw a, a spanner in the works. Sorry, this is America. A wrench in the works. All right? Because sometimes we, see, we need to keep a certain humility when it comes to God. If the disciple said, who is this? Because he acts in a way that I really did not expect. As an Adventist pastor, I have long, long put all that certainty to the back burner and says, you know what? If God wants to work the way he does, that's fine by me. That's fine by me. 
So when in Genesis 21, I read that God was with the boy, and that was not Isaac, that was Ishmael. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. So Hagar and Ishmael is exhibit number one. Now exhibit number two was the other illustration that was used last week by the preacher. And that was the widow of Zarephath. 1 Kings 17. You know, Elijah the Tishbite walks into the throne room. Elijah the Tishbite walks into the Oval Office, past all the security, doesn't care about any metal detectors and secret service agents, just walks in there and is able to do so, and then says, there's not going to be any rain or dew or any water for th until I say so, and walks back out. He doesn't get arrested, nobody is able to hold him, and he's gone. So the story of the widow in Zarephath in 1 Kings 17 is, pre is preceded by the prophet taking refuge east of the Jordan. So after he says this thing to the king, God says to Elijah, I want you to hide. I want you to hide across the river. Israel is divided or was divided um, by a river, the Jordan. It runs straight north to south. And west of the Jordan is where the action is. East of the Jordan is a little quieter. So last week I used this example. If you're from New York, anybody from New York? Yeah, so if you're from New York, west of the Jordan is New York. East of the Jordan is the other side of the Hudson. New Jersey. Right? The action is over there, and we're just here in New Jersey, you know what I mean? Uh, I tried to contextualize this thing, but... So the east is where nothing much happens, east of the John, and there he hides by the brook, and God tells Elijah, I'm going to send ravens to feed you. I'm using, I'm, I'm taking my time because I need to build this up. Sorry, Eli Elijah's like, God, yeah, I understand, but who, who's going to come and feed me? I'm going to send ravens to feed you. Well, you see, doves would have been fine. You know, they're, they're, they're clean animals. You can use them to sacrifice. Well, back then, you could use them to sacrifice. They were acceptable animals to a good Israelite. Later on, they, they are used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Perfectly acceptable to good church folk. Raven. Not quite. Ravens are unclean birds in the Jewish economy. So God, run this by me again. Who's going to come and feed me? The unclean bird is going to come and feed you. And you're going to eat the food that these ravens bring in you. In, in, in the Jewish legislation, if there's something unclean and you touch it, automatically you become unclean. So if an unclean raven bird brings you food, and let's for argument's sake say it wasn't roadkill, it was real food, the food that the raven brings to you in his beak, well, I can't eat that. That was touched by this bird. And who knows where that beak was before he picked up my food. It was unclean. An unclean bird is directed by God to feed his prophets. Keep that in mind because once the brook dries up and the raven doesn't come any longer, God tells Elijah, all right, time to get up because now I'm going to send you someplace else to someone who's going to feed you. Now the, up to now the raven, the unclean bird has fed you. Now I'm going to send you to Zarephath in Sidon. Sidon is not in Israel. It's outside of Israel and Pastor Pottinger mentioned that, that the king of Sidon was Ahab's father-in-law, Jezebel's father. So these people were Gentiles, and in the Jewish thought, Gentiles are 
the opposite of clean. They are unclean. You don't have dealings with Gentiles because they are out there. If they want to become one of us, then they have to come in and they have to go undergo circumcision and do all this other stuff and then they become part of Israel and then they may be clean enough for, them to, for me to approach them. But before that, no. Can't have anything to do with these people. God sends a, um, Elijah to Zarephath, which is in Sidon, which is not in Israel, which is, of course, inhabited by non-Israelites, in unclean people. So after Elijah was fed by the unclean raven, he is now fed by the unclean widow in Sidon, in Zarephath. We're talking about the other children today. See, the problem with this is not that the widows of Israel had less faith than the widow in Zarephath. I'm sure there must have been in this vast ni nation of God believers, somebody, some widow, some person who was still loyal to God. And I know there was. What's his name? Obadiah or whatever, that dude who worked for the king. He hid a hundred prophets when Jezebel lost her marbles and she killed all the other prophets. He went out of the way and he hid 50 here and 50 there. That man was a true believer and he worked in the king's household. So yes, there were people around. So why did God send his prophet not to Obadiah's basement where he could have hid with the other prophets or the cave where he hid them all why did God send him to Zarephath who is this God that uses the enemy to feed sustain his prophets who is this God that tells his prophet to give a promise to that widow before she makes up her mind to give up her last bit of food? Because the story, of course, was as Elijah walks into the, into the village of Zarephath, he sees the, the, the widow and he asks her for a drink. And then he thinks, okay, that's probably the one who the Lord is talking about. And then he says, well, give me something to eat as well while you're at it. And she says, well, I would love to, but here's the thing. I only got a handful of flour left and a tiny bit of oil and these few sticks that I'm gathering here now because I'm going to make a small fire. I'm going to turn this little bit of flour and this tiny bit of oil into a flat cake and then we're going to fry this and bake this thing on a hot stove on a hot stone above this little tiny fire. Then I'm going to share that with my boy and then we're going to starve to death. That's my plan. And Elijah tells her, well, now I want you to give that to me. I say, what? Which part of I'm going to eat this and then my boy and I were going to die? Didn't you understand? No, that, that's not how the story goes. The widow was not asked to give this food to Elijah blindly. Elijah told the widow before she decided, here's what the Lord says. You're going to give me the, you're going to give this food to the prophet. I'm going to make sure that your kitchen will never run out of supplies until it rains. Okay. So now the widow has to make a choice. And it's based on more than just the ramblings of a crazy Israelite prophet who just wanders into the village and says, give me your last food. No, now she has to decide, am I going to rely on God's promise to sustain me? What kind of God is this that would give a member of the other side, of the enemy, a promise of sustaining until it would rain again? And she says, okay, I'll take your God up on his word. She feeds the prophet and voila, there is always flour and there's always oil and there's always supplies in her kitchen until the day it would rain again and then there would be natural supplies. God sustained the widow in Zarephath, which lives and is part of the other side, the others, 
God sustains that widow who's part of the other children. I'll let that sink in a little bit longer. Because sometimes we believe that God naturally can only bless us. When I hear it on the news, and I'm sorry if I tread on a few sto uh, toes now, I'm a permanent resident of this, resident of this country. Right? So I have a green card. I pay my taxes. I have almost the same rights as a citizen. The only thing is I can't vote in federal elections. But I'm a permanent resident here. So this is my country right now. But when I hear people in this, my country, say that God bless America and they mean that this is the only country that God will bless, I have an issue with that. Now again, you can say that. You can say whatever you want. But trust me, you don't want to meet my boss with that kind of attitude. God blesses Russia the same way he blesses the U.S., the same way he blesses Afghanistan and Iran, the same way he blesses Mexico and Canada and Germany and Australia and China and North Korea. Because when God looks at the planet, he just sees a bunch of crazy humans. Who need his help? I know my green card is going to stay on this planet and going to burn up with it. When this is all over and Jesus comes, I ain't taking my green card nowhere. It stays right here with my German passport. Because that was just the crutch to help me through this part of human history. When God starts to look out for people who we think have no right to be on God's radar, that's when we have an issue. Who is this that he would do that? How can God be as concerned about the undocumented workers in this country as much as he is about the citizens of this country? How can God be as concerned about the good, upstanding citizens as, and he's as concerned about them as he is about the guys who are about to dry, uh, to dry, dry out and, 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 and um, die of thirst in the Mexican Texas, New Mexico desert. You think God loves me more than that person? Do you think that God doesn't have any concern about the hundreds of migrants that drowned in the last couple of weeks in the Mediterranean Sea? God's heart breaks just as much over those unnamed refugees as it breaks over somebody who dies here on these, our shores. Last couple of days, my home country was in the news. And when I look at the pictures, I'm thinking, well, God loves the people who throw the stones as much as he loves the people who are on the other side. And he loves these 20 people as well, who stand there on that stage looking all smug. Yes, even the guy with the weird hair. I was talking about the French Prime Minister. Although actually I think his hair was quite good. No, God doesn't make a distinction between the protesters outside the White House and inside the Oval Office. I have to learn that too. What kind of God is this? Hagar and Ishmael, the outcasts. The widow of Zarephath, the enemy. Exhibit number three in Acts chapter 10. Peter is sent to Joppa, a small village by the lake. And he's staying there with Simon the Tanner, who lives right by the shore. Which makes sense because he's a tanner and that's a water, in, uh, a water intensive occupation. It's also a very well known place because tanning creates certain byproducts that don't go unnoticed. Meanwhile, in Caesarea, where the Romans had their headquarters, 
which is a town named after Caesar, the head of the occupying force in that country. Meanwhile, in Caesarea, there is a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. He prays. He gives to the poor. He does all the good thing, all the good stuff, and he is a believer. And God goes to Cornelius, the Gentile, the member of the occupying force, and says to Cornelius, I want you to send somebody to Joppa and to ask for Simon Peter. He stays with Simon the Tanner. Get him here. Sometimes God speaks in riddles and vague language, but that was fairly precise. Don't go to Marlton. I want you to go, Linda, to Medford. So when you drive down 70, no, I don't want you to stop at the Walmart in Marlton. I want you to continue down until you get to Medford. And then you make a right, and there is a house right there on the left. I can't remember the color, but that's the house. And that's where I want you to ring the bell, and you're going to ask for John Doe. So that's what God told Cornelius. And Cornelius is like, cool, a vision from God. The man has one up on me. Never had a vision myself. And he takes two of his trusted servants and a soldier, who was also a believer, and he sends them away, and they go to Joppa, and it takes a day to get there. As they approach the house in which Peter is staying, Peter gets hungry, gets up onto the roof, and falls into a trance and has a vision. And in the vision, he sees a, a big piece of cloth being lowered from heaven, and it has all sorts of interesting animals there that Peter wouldn't even touch. And then the thing goes back up, and it comes back down, and it happens three times. And Peter's like, huh? You see, he speaks quite, quite directly to the new believer, Cornelius the Gentile, but with his long-time disciple Peter, God is a little bit more, uh, he's been with us for a while, he figured it out. Let's make it interesting for him, shall we? Yes, the animal in the cloth vision. And while Peter is wondering, what was that about? Because, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that the voice came out of heaven and says, Peter, you're hungry, go and kill and eat this. And Peter's like, <laughs> yeah, good one, no. I can't eat that, that's unclean. And the voice says, don't, don't call unclean what I call clean. So Peter is like, whoa, wait. Doesn't the doctrine say, doesn't the clear testimony state that I can't eat this? So what does it mean? And while he is breaking his brain around this conundrum, there's a knock on the door. And the people from Cornelius arrive. And they tell him the story how yesterday the man had a vision and they send him here. And now... The lights go on in Peter's head. And so they stay. I love the, the, the ancient Middle Eastern traditions. You see, if this was in New Jersey, Peter would have said, all right, let's go. Pick up his keys and out the door they go. And by the evening they would have arrived. But in the story, back in those days, you invite the people in. Come, you've been traveling a whole day. Sit, eat, stay the night. Tomorrow, we'll travel back. It takes four days altogether for them to finally get back to Cornelius. And when he gets there, Peter finally realizes what the vision meant. You see, Jews were not allowed to have any interaction with the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, unclean people. Even stepping into a house... Where these people live makes you unclean. You can't do that. But now Peter is like, whoa, wait a second. Don't call unclean what God has called clean. So he steps into the house 
and explains to Cornelius, who by then has amassed a large audience to listen to Peter, explain to them the work of Jesus and the gospel. And while Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on all of these Gentiles, no Jews. The only Jews in the house is Peter and the few people that came with him. The Holy Spirit falls on all of them, all of a sudden. And they start speaking in other languages. And Peter's like, wait a second. I remember that. That happened to us at Pentecost. When all of a sudden we were there together and out of the blue, the Holy Spirit just... And Peter realizes God has other children that he had been brought up to ignore and shun. But God had to teach his disciple, his Peter, not to. Amen. And that's a lovely place to finish, right? If it weren't for the next couple of verses. You see, if only it's all finished in Acts 10. They sat around the fire in the evening and they sang Kumbaya. And they were one happy family. Chapter 11, verse 1. The apostles and the believers throughout Judah, Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. The who? The Gentiles. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of the uncircumcised and ate with them. There are people in our sphere that we have been brought up and taught to ignore and to shun. You have them and I have them. All of us has a group of people or certain individuals who we wouldn't touch with the barge pole. In other words, we keep them as far away from us as possible because we don't want to be contaminated with their heresy. Now, that could be religious. And as Adventists, I can list a long list of, of things and people and groups who we have on there. I leave that up to you and the Holy Spirit to bring that to your remembrance. That could be national. We may have been brought up with the idea that this is the... Best thing since sliced bread. And anybody who doesn't agree with us, well, let them stay there. Or better, why don't you go back to your country? That could be educational. That could be financial. There are many categories I could list of us categorizing human beings and certain of these categories are untouchable for us. They must be shunned. They mustn't even be mentioned. No, we have nothing to do with them because they are beyond the reach of even God himself. Or so we think. You see, the problem with that kind of thinking is that in the scripture, we just saw three examples where God says, <laughs> you, <sighs> you human, Stefan, with your limited understanding, in other words, God is telling me, how can you be so stupid, man? I'm God. I love all these humans. Not just you, Adventist preacher. See, there's a parallel between Peter's reception in Jerusalem and Peter's master. In Luke 15, in verse 1, we read that Jesus is teaching and preaching to sinners and prostitutes. They were there to listen to him. 
And in verse 2 of Luke 15, we hear the response of the good people. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Luke 15, the response of the Pharisees to Jesus reaching out to the untouchables, the exact same reaction that the, uncirc the circumcised believers, these were Christians who were Jews, that the circumcised believers now criticize Peter with. You went into the house of the uncircumcised and you ate with them. In other words, you didn't just go there, drop your little flyer or Bible study card and then ran away. No, you interacted with these people. You shared a meal with them. That means your hands went into the same big dish that their hands went into. And you didn't care that at the moment when their hands touched that food, because that's how people ate in those days, the whole dish would have been unclean. And so now you're eating unclean food. But you didn't care about this Jesus, did you, when you eat with these sinners and with these prostitutes? You didn't care about this Peter, didn't you, when you walked into, into the uncircumcised home and you ate with them? Because Jesus and Peter are used as an example and as a lesson to us. Don't call unclean what God calls clean. Now let me make one thing very clear here. Just because I embrace somebody from a certain system, religion, country or whatever does not mean that I now excuse, condone, or even accept the system that they are still part of, are about to come out of. Okay? Let me make this clear. But the problem is in our churches, and with us personally, we sometimes can't distinguish between the system and the people. So now all Catholics go to hell. I, listen, I've been told that that's been, been, that's been preached in churches. Who are you to judge over Roman Catholics? God did not put you on this planet to say that. And God told me to say that. I'm not your judge. You are not their judge. God is everybody's judge. And you will be surprised how many... Weird people will be on the sea of glass and you wonder how, what, what? But you just be happy that you are there, right? And then Jesus will come to you when it's your turn and he will explain all this to you. Here's why they are here. Shouldn't you be happy? A huh? bit like Luke 15, the older brother, the father comes out to argue with the younger brother. With the, sorry, the father goes out and argues with the older son who says, what? The younger son? My younger brother is in the house and they're having a part. How dare the father let him back in the house? And the father says, let's just celebrate and be happy. I'm going to explain this all to you. Nobody is going to listen to me if even with the best of intentions and the soundest of theologies and doctrines, I go to a person with a holier-than-thou attitude and I preach to them from up here to down there, they're not going to listen to me. That may have worked 50 years ago, yes, but we're not there any longer. We're in 2017 because if you do that to me, I know that it'll be like, Time out. While I check my emails, why don't you continue talking to the hand? People need to know that God cares, and so do we. And they don't know that if we categorize them, quite categorize them into the other children and kick them to the curb. So if God sustains Hagar and Ishmael and was with that boy 
if God uses the widow in the enemy territory to feed his prophets, after he fed him already with unclean birds as the vehicles to bring his food, if God gives a vision to a Gentile Roman soldier and then teaches his own apostle that it's okay to interact with them. God has taught me a long time ago that when I interact with people who I was brought up to shun and to think that they are unclean, God has taught me a long time that that is wrong. I interact with them. I even pray with them. Sometimes they pray for me. <gasps> and I've met wonderful Christ followers outside the Adventist church. Oh, that's a very sweet but weak amen there. So let me in closing tell you that they are there. The Hagars and the Ishmaels. They are there, the widow of Zarephath. They are there, the Corneliuses. They are there. And God used them and touched them. In closing, literally, there's two ways to respond to this. Let's start with the negative one first and end on a positive note, shall we? So Jesus uses the widow of Zarephath as an illustration. We heard that last week. In Luke 4, when Jesus comes to his hometown, and he uses the widow and Naaman, uh, for, uh, um, an enemy general who was healed of leprosy, he uses these two examples as, um, as an illustration to say that you can't limit God to your own little sphere. And when the audience, the church of the day, heard that, when they heard our Lord and Savior say that it was okay to use the widow of Zarephath, it was okay that only Naaman got healed and he was an enemy, none of the lepers in Israel, no, the enemy, none of the widows in Israel, no, the one in Zarephath. When they heard that, this is the first way of reacting to God's weird way of dealing with the other children. In Luke 4 verse 29, they kick him out of church and Nazareth must have had some cliff somewhere because we read in verse 29 that they were ready to throw him off the cliff. Cherry Hill is much less hilly. No cliffs here. Thank you. But they were ready to kill the Lord. That's the first way of reacting. The second way of reacting is found in Acts 11. After Peter now explains to these complaining brothers, brethren, brothers of his, the Jewish Christians, after Peter now explains to them, you see, they had a good reason because in the Bible of the day, God did say you must be circumcised, didn't he? In the Bible of the day, which was what now we call the Old Testament, God said, you don't have interaction with these people. So yes, they had good Bible texts that they could throw at Peter, but Peter threw something bad back at them. And he said, when I preached to these people, God himself, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like he did on us back on Pentecost. So how could I deny them that how could I deny them baptism how could I work against God he shared his experience with them and now they reacted to that and that reaction is in verse 18 when they heard this they were silenced. They had no further objection, it says in my translation. And they praised God, saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. 
to ways of responding to God's strange dealings with his other children. Either you want to kill him or you praise him for it. I can't decide for you. I've long decided for myself. But I urge you, next time you are tempted to categorize humanity into neat little boxes. Again, I'm not talking about systems and, and, and the values of those systems. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people. Separate the people from the system. You can talk about the system. You can demonstrate against the system. You can rant against the systems. Fine. But the people, when they are there, they may love that system. They may not know better. You have to have them in mind. Because that's how God dealt with his other children. So you can hate him for that, or you can do what the circumcised brethren did in Jerusalem that day. Praise him for it. And maybe, 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 it will be a small beacon of hope to the cynic who has written off Jesus and his followers a long time ago. When he sees you, one of those followers, treat him or her like a human being again. Maybe that will be a glimpse of hope and a window of opportunity into who Jesus really is. Not the caricature that some of these well-meaning followers have painted off him. No, the real Jesus of whom the disciples said, Who is this? May God bless you as you and I begin to deal the Jesus way with his other children. In closing him. What did I say? 5.31? It's 5.31. Now, I need to know how many of us don't know the song. It's depending on how many hands go up. I will stay behind this mic or I won't. 5.31. Who does not know the song? Okay, that's fine. You'll catch it. You'll catch it. I'll stay here anyway. We are built on the rock, the living rock, on Jesus, the rock of ages. So shall we abide the fearful shock when loud the tempest rages. We are built on the rock, we will build on the rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock, on Christ the mighty rock. Oh, some build on the sinking sands of life, on the fictions of earthly treasure. Some build on the waves of sin and strife, of fame and worldly pleasure. We will build on the rock, we will build on the rock, we'll build on the rock, on the solid rock, on Christ the mighty rock. Oh, build on the rock forever sure, the firm and the true foundation. 
Its hope is the hope which shall endure, the hope of all salvation. We will build on the rock, we will build on the rock, we will build on the rock, the solid rock, on Christ the mighty Let us pray. Father, we come to you as the Father of our Lord Jesus, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We ask that you would grant us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with might by your Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of you, O God. Now to you who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto you be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.